Hello and welcome to week 9 of New Testament Introduction to New Testament. Today we're going to be looking at Hebrews and 1st and 2nd Peter. Um, this, uh, again, a whole lot of material to cover, but I have a feeling this is going to be a short lecture because a lot of this stuff is going to be um, very familiar to you if you're reading through the New Testament and uh, participating in the course, which everybody is. So, uh, let's jump into it. Okay, the author of Hebrews is unknown. Uh, I grew up thinking that Paul wrote it, or in other words, uh, pastors always told me that Paul wrote it, but uh, we really don't know. Uh, it's anonymous. That means that uh, nobody claimed authorship in the beginning of the letter, which is a little strange, but uh, it's possible that that has been lost. Um, people have assumed that because it mentions Timothy in an intimate way, that it was written by Paul. But a lot of other people knew Timothy, and this particular letter, uh, the Hebrew of Hebrews, does not correspond with Pauline theology almost at all. Uh, it's something that is entirely independent of Paul's thinking. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. But I have uh, just made this point right here. Uh, and the letter also was written for further distribution. And that's really important because, we, you know, we saw in the letter uh, of Colossians that they were supposed to, to share with their letter with the Laodiceans. And the Laodiceans were to share the letter with the Colossians. So they were, they were, the ch early churches were told by Paul or by uh, pseudo-Paul, which is fake Paul, to exchange letters. And so we get a, a very uh, good look at what was happening in the early church. You know, the church in Rome would receive a letter from Paul or an authoritative letter from Asia Minor, and they would, they would share it in turn with churches in Spain. And churches in Spain would share it with churches in Alexandria. So the um, exchange of letters between the churches and also exchange of gospels happened at a very, very early point in, in, Christian, in Christian history. Uh, so that's something that was, that's interesting to me about uh, you know, the historicity of this letter. And Paul never did that, by the way. Okay, place and time of writing. Uh, most probably the epistle uh, to the Hebrews was written in Rome, and uh, it's most likely written late, that is, after the life and time of Paul. Um, there's no mention of the destruction of the temple, so some people have dated it early. But the church structure that is um, present in the epistle to the Hebrews suggests it's written a lot later than that. And the reason why it wasn't the temple was not mentioned is because it's written in Rome by a Gentile, someone who uh, didn't care so much that the uh, temple had been destroyed. And it was written in Rome and not Jerusalem. So that particular historical event doesn't have as much impact, you know, on the other side of the world. So that's why we think that the Epistle of Hebrews is most likely written late and not by Paul. The intended readership of Hebrews. Now this is, this is really interesting to me because the content of Hebrews has a whole lot of references to the Old Testament. You know, uh, and it leads you to think that it was written at a time when the Gentiles and Jews were unified in Christianity. But this actually was written late, and it was written after the break had been complete between Christianity and Judaism, and Christianity was its own entity. However, it has been important, even to this day, that Christians are united with the Old Testament theologically, that is, we have the same God as the Old Testament, 
Christians always want to prove that. Uh, we are fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament, and we are a um, historically smooth. We're, we have a historically smooth connection. In other words, Judaism has its beginnings with Abraham, and then the uh, relationship of the Jews with God, or, or God's chosen people, goes all the way back to Adam. So Christianity, it, we say, is a smooth transition from the Jews that worship God in the Old Testament to the Gentiles who worship God in the New Testament, along with some Jews. So that started very early, and when you're reading Hebrews, it's very, very clear that the author wants a smooth transition from ancient Judaism to present Christianity. And this has been taken up, you know, this topic has been taken up by Christian apologists, that is, people who want to give a reason for the faith, you know, argue logically for Christianity. Christians are doing that to this day, and sometimes they do it to the exclusion of Jews, and sometimes they do it to the inclusion of Jews, like the promises of God to, the, to Jews are still in effect, and we need to appreciate the relationship that God has with His chosen people. So, we see the earliest, I think, example of a Gentile Christian wanting to connect Judaism and Christianity in Hebrews. And so, the intended readers are people that would benefit from this kind of thing. Now, I want you to know that uh, in the Bible, there were God-fearers mentioned. And God-fearers were Gentile believers in God who attended synagogue, but they did not follow the dietary restrictions of the Jews. So, that looks a lot like Christianity, only it's flipped. You know, the, the Gentiles are outsiders, and the Jews in the synagogue are insiders. And when Paul comes along and talks about how you uh, don't have to practice those dietary laws anymore to be fully accepted, then the Jews are outsiders, and they have to give up their kosher lifestyle in order to uh, fellowship with Christian brothers. So there, there was a movement in early Christianity and, and we see it in the Gospels, we see it in Paul, and we especially see it in Hebrews, to unify Jews and Gentiles under the common faith. But in Hebrews, it's clearly the opposite, where the Gentiles are the insiders. You know, they didn't have to give up any of their um, religious beliefs in the one true God in order to become a Christian, but the Jews do. So... Um, the uh, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says that uh, the, the readers have become sluggish and dull in their faith. They're neglecting church, in the, church attendance, and they must start with the fundamentals. And uh, there's also a theme of the apostasy from faith and second repentance. And this is really important because in Hebrews... Uh, there was a there was a persecution of Christians, and a lot of Christians were denying the faith, and then wanting to um, join back in the Christian fellowship, and that's what uh, second second repentance is about. You know, they repent from their sins again, and therefore they can be accepted in the community. Okay, there's, like I said, the intended, attended, intended readers had a problem of denying the faith. And let me tell you, it was, there was a pretty big pressure on them to deny the faith. Uh, we know in the, letter, the uh, epistle of Pliny, he was a, uh, a governor of Melanthia, where Christians were, and he found two Christian slaves... They were both women, and he tortured them to death. And they gave up 
their uh, the location of the other Christians, and he brought them in, and made them either re either reject Christ three times, like Peter, or they would be killed. And he also said that they would have to make a sacrifice to Caesar, in in order to. Uh, show that they're no longer a Christian anymore, because no Christian could do that. So, Christians were under a lot of pressure in some areas to give up their churches and, you know, their, their new families, and some of these people made it out alive, and the Christian community had a, a very tough choice. You know, do we want to accept a repentant person back into the community, or are we going to let them suffer, suffer the consequences of the betrayal and remain outside of the community? So this is something that Hebrews tackles, along with many other writings in the New Testament, especially the later ones. So uh, Hebrews, uh, you know, if you deny the faith, you, prevent, you, you are profaning the covenant that uh, God has with you. So he comes down on it pretty hard. And he says that you are to stand fast, and you're going to enter into the end times rest. Do not abandon the faith. Man, somebody messed this thing up. Okay, they had a new the the Gentiles had a new con, a new confession, and so did the Jews if they believed in in uh, the saving work of Jesus Christ. And the author of Hebrews is writing to, to a group that is having to face persecution right after they have converted to Christianity. Okay, this is more on uh, the differences between Paul and Hebrews, in case anyone thinks that Paul wrote of this epistle. The just, justification by faith is not important in Hebrews. It's barely even present. And this is important because we saw in the, in the very earliest writing of Paul, in First and Second Thessalonians, we have the kernel of justification by faith, uh, and then it's expressed in its most uh, perfected form in Galatians and in Romans, and it's something that is in every one of Paul's genuine letters. Now, if Paul would have written Hebrews, we would see some footprint of his justification by faith, and it's certainly not there. Now, Paul and Hebrews do agree that, if you, if you look here between the S, uh, the law cannot provide salvation. That's something that they agree, and also that Christ reveals the weaknesses of the law. However, they're talking about the different laws. Hebrews is talking about cultic law, you know, like uh, laws of <clears throat> laws of concerning worship, like the kosher laws, eating the eating the unclean foods and such. And Paul is talking about the prescriptive law, which is basically the whole thing. You remember uh, Paul talking about um, if you break one law, you've broken the entire law. You know, he's not, Paul's not concerned with just laws concerning worship or laws concerning theology. Paul is concerned about following the law in order to be saved. And uh, as you know, he argues against that, which is not present in Hebrews. Okay, on to 1 Peter. Now, we don't know who the author is of 1 Peter. Traditionally, in the, in the early days of the church, uh, you know, when, when Christians were writing in 300 and 400 CE, they believed that Peter, uh, Simon Peter, wrote this. And um, most likely it's not. It looks like in a later Christian writing, uh, it has a sophistic Greek style that Simon Peter would not have, which is uh, sophistic means 
basically it's literal he follows a literary Koine Greek instead of a, a an oral Koine Greek like other New Testament documents you know the um, apostles were fishermen and one was a tax collector one was a doctor most likely all of them were illiterate with the exception of Luke you know Luke was a doctor and doctors studied written texts but there are plenty of doctors who could not read you know we're going to give uh, Luke the benefit of the doubt but most of them were fishermen and they were poor they couldn't read and so their um, gospels reflect oral traditions you know there it was passed down orally and then written down first Peter on the other hand follows literary style which is the written style of Greek from uh, the more uh, educated people in the ancient world in other words we think that uh, especially because he cites the Septuagint all the time that this the writer was literate himself and follows that uh, written style so that's a pretty significant difference and also the writer is a presbyter refers to himself as a presbyter and not an apostle again if Simon Peter would have written it he would have definitely uh, called himself an apostle and not a presbyter the difference is not you know not only is a role different but it reflects a different organization of the early church the presbyters were overseers and they come after the first generation of the church and the only office which was around in the first generation was apostle so you know we see that church structure is is a lot of uh, the argument as to why a document comes later because we know a little bit about how the early church structure developed now he cites the Old Testament primarily from the Septuagint which is not surprising because most people uh, most Jews read the Septu knew the Septuagint anyway but uh, I haven't looked into in, into it in um, first Peter per se but I can tell you that most of the quotations in the Bible of the Old Testament are hard to identify because they do not follow the Hebrew version of the Old Testament and they also do not follow the Septuagint that we have you know we have many copies of the Septuagint just like the Bible and the uh, you know like when Paul quotes the Old Testament he never quotes word for word the Septuagint or word for word what the Hebrew would have said like he like as if he would have translated it himself so it's not unusual that the writer who's writing in Greek cites the uh, Greek Old Testament most likely this document is pseudepigraphal pseudo means false false and pigrapha means writing it's a falsely attributed writing to Peter okay the place and time of comp composition is unknown uh, you can see there's a pretty big uh, 35 year gap between 65 and 100 CE but most scholars think that it was written around 90 CE because of the uh, church structure and we don't know where it came from okay this is something else that's interesting about the authorship you know the audience dictates the authorship just a little bit because how you perceive your audience you know we can tell how, he, how the author perceives the audience and that perception gives us a reflection of the author I hope that makes sense um, he the author addresses Christians in Roman provinces Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and uh, Bithynia. The Bithynia is where Pliny the Younger was from. In 90 CE, he recorded he, as governor, 
his persecution of Christians. Now, the audience is primarily Gentile Christians who live with and associate with the Roman provinces. If it was a Jewish author or a, you know, a, a strictly Jewish author, like they're not very Hellenized, they would not have referred to these five areas in their, by their Roman, Roman provincial names. Okay, it's mostly, the audience is mostly Gentile Christians. And there, there are uh, some reasons for this, is the repeated reference to their repentance from worshiping idols and from, you know, their Gentile, their, you know, barbaric Gentile ways. Uh, so we think that, uh, you know, obviously this is probably not a Jew writing to Jews. And also, their call to become part of the people of God. They were not already. They were not already part of the people of God. And then also, some husbands of Christian women are explicitly Gentile. Slaves are in the community. Perhaps also slave owners, but we don't know for sure. The reason why uh, I think slave owners are there is because. In the household codes, um, Paul says for slaves to obey their masters. And it wouldn't, you know, it makes sense that, okay, Christians would teach, their, Christians would teach slaves to go and obey their, um, gentile, their uh, unbelieving masters. But the thing is, how would the slaves be in the community if they were not attending with their masters? You know, you can't just leave the house anytime you want and go to a Christian meeting. In, in order for slaves to be present, they would have to be uh, with their Christian masters. So whenever the teacher in, uh, that wrote Hebrews says for slaves to obey masters, it's most likely that the slave was, right, was sitting right beside his or her master uh, in the community, uh, you know, in the uh, worship service. And that is called social stratification. That's why I wrote stratified here. That means that there are different strata of, of uh, social status. You know, there's some lower status, some in the middle, and very, very few at the top. You know, masters and slaves. Okay, a lot of First Peter deals with suffering and this is uh, one thing that makes the letter so special because as Christians we can uh, look to this epistle for guidance whenever we're suffering and it seems like uh, we're suffering more than we deserve sometimes but uh, there's always hope. The word, the Greek word translated suffer appears 42 times in 1 Peter and 1 Peter is not a very long epistle. You know, it's one of the shortest writings in the New Testament. And uh, to, see, to see something like that uh, repeated so often, it just brings to mind the suffering that Christians were under uh, whenever they were governed by someone like Pliny the Younger. And I've mentioned Pliny several times because he was the governor of one of the um, provinces mentioned in First Peter. Okay, basic theological ideas. What does this say about God? You know, and, and this, the first point comes from the idea of suffering, you know, the theme of suffering. This world is not a place for Christians. It's a basic, basic, a basic theological idea. <clears throat> and the reason for this is we have new life in Christ. And that's why we are suffering uh, in persecution. But we have a joyful hope of his return. And baptism is the uh, catalyst for this teaching. You know, that with we are suffering... The, the last point, we are suffering as Christ suffered. We are suffering with Christ. 
buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life, with a joyful hope that Christ will return. So the theological idea of suffering is bound up in the person of Jesus Christ. So, more on suffering, 42 times. It appears as a result of Christian conduct. Uh, I had alluded to that on the previous slide. You know, the reason why Christians were persecuted is because the man was the head of the household back then, and the, or the oldest man, and his religion was the religion of the household. And <clears throat> it wasn't uh, the deal that, uh, you know, the head of the household wasn't watching over everyone's religion all the time. But if you converted to Christianity that didn't like idols, that was um, imposing a different type of morality on the family. Um, it could cause you a lot of heartache and pain because the head of the household controlled everything. You know, the, they controlled the, or delegated the control of the business, family business, uh, the way you get food into the household, the, the way that you marry, uh, you know, every aspect of life had to be uh, run by the head of the household or done in such a way that the head of the household would approve it. So, <clears throat> when, a, when someone converted to Christianity from a Gentile household, they most likely were going to be cut off from every type of assistance that the household brings. And that basically includes, you know, everything. They don't they have a capitalist um, economy where you can go out, if you're a son, you can go out and buy a car. If you have enough money, you know, the uh, father has to approve of everything. So uh, Christians were exposed to every type of abuse from their neighbors and from their governors and from their families. So the idea here in, in 1 Peter that they are uh, suffering as a result of their Christian conduct is absolutely 100% historically correct. And in suffering, he teaches, we encounter God's will. And it seems to me that uh, some churches have really, really run too far in the idea that we experience Christ in our sufferings. And, um, you know, some examples are how some churches glorify suffering. You know, suffering is uh, the way that we see God, so we rejoice in suffering, but we don't glorify it and celebrate it. You know, um, I, I, the thing that comes to mind is whenever you're in a Christian school and they see you misbehaving and they slap your wrist real hard with a ruler and the child is suffering and then the teacher says, well, you're, you can experience Christ best when you're suffering. Or pe Christians who uh, allow their bodies to be damaged and uh, they, they fast for just for the pleasure of suffering uh, is just a little bit, um, it goes a little bit too far and it takes out of context the type of suffering that these early Christians were uh, undergoing. And it also demonstrates that you are finished with sin and your unrighteousness has now become righteousness. So you can see there's a lot of motivation to bring suffering upon yourself in order to experience Christ in a fresh new way. But this is something that definitely was um, imposed on these early Christians, and this is how the author teaches them to get through it. Okay, Second Peter. <clears throat> 
I'm sorry, I've been fighting a cold for about a week. <laughs> Whoops. Apparently this didn't get in right. Sorry if this makes you dizzy. Oh, come on. Okay. This is really cool because um, we're getting back into the, um, the idea that or the problem, rather, whenever we encounter two different Christian writings that are very similar. Um, Second Peter assumes almost all the content of Jude. And this brings to mind Q, which is, uh, you know, the idea that Matthew, Mark, and Luke had one similar source, which is Q, and it eventually became Mark, and then Mark appears in Matthew and Luke. So, I mean, it's really confusing, but uh, there's a lot of similar content there. So the problem is we have to, we have to sort out, how, you know, who was first? Um, who's copying off of who? You know, who knew what? And that's significant because the changes that they make tell you specific things about the community. Now... We're going to get into more detail about, uh, you know, specifically how Second Peter uses Jude, but um, it's something that is that tells us a lot about the community. Now, the time and place of the compos of the composition was um, okay. It was around 110 CE, and we don't know uh, where it's from. And the reason why it's dated like this is because there's two writings, one of that use Second uh, Peter. One of them is the Apocalypse of Peter, Apocalypse of Peter which is a uh, pseudepigraphal writing that originated in Christian churches. Some some people think it's Gnostic. Um, I referred to it in the very first lecture of the course, but I don't expect you to re to remember that. Um, it's like the, the revelation of Peter. It's an apocalyptic, end times writing. It was written about 135 CE, and it presumes 2 Peter. It doesn't quote 2 Peter, but it uses it, uses the material. And then 1 Clement, which is also a very early writing, it's written in about 90, 95 CE. It's very compl comparable to 2 Peter. So, because of those two writings that were dated between 90 and 135, scholars think it was written about 110. Okay, on 2 Peter and Jude. Uh, the, the very first thing this teaches us about 2 Peter is that 2 Peter is promoting the acceptance of Jude. You know, Jude is a tiny, uh, you know, one-page document in the New Testament and it, it you know you're when you copy something you are um, bringing your that material in and using it again in a different in a different audience that may not have accepted the original document or the original material so second Peter is promoting the acceptance of Jew and he shapes, the writer shapes, I'm so sorry I keep saying he, could have been written by a woman. Uh, the, the writer shapes the material for a new historical situation. And it's what he, what the writer excludes from Jude, from ex the material from Jude, that the writer of Second Peter excludes, tells us more about the historical situation. And the first thing that, he, that the writer excludes is the polemic in Jude. And the reason why he excludes it is because his, the opponents that Jude faces, 
are not the same opponents that Second Peter faces, and I'm not sure that Second that that Second Peter even addresses opponents. And the other thing that's missing is the wilderness warning. You know that is. We we need to remember, you know, it, in Jude it says that we need to remember the you know what happened to the. Um, the Jews who were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. You know, that can happen to us. You know, we need to take that as a warning. That's excluded in Second Peter because he has a different situation. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, it didn't come off, when I said it, as interesting as I thought it is, but uh, there, there are other relationships that Second Peter has with the canonical New Testament. One of them is with Matthew. And the other is with Jewish literature. Now, with Matthew, Second Peter shares the transfiguration story, the reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, the way of righteousness, and dogs and swine. You know, the uh, you don't cast your treasure to you know your pearl to swine, or they'll come back and and rip you to shreds. So. Uh, there are some relationships, some contacts between Second Peter and Matthew. It's impressive, I think, that there are four because Second Peter is so short. You know, it just makes every reference uh, that more, that much more significant. And also, whenever Second uh, Peter references flood or water as a means of judgment for um, for sinners. Uh, that is something that is widely used in Jewish literature. Now, there's, there was one reference in, uh, I believe it was in the Apocalypse of Peter, that had the, uh, the flood as being a means of judgment. And, um, but all the other references, there's like 20 references in Josephus and Philo, and um, intertestamental, you know, the Apocrypha, intertestamental li literature of uh, flood being used as a means of judgment. So that is Hebrews and First and Second Peter. I hope you all are enjoying uh, reading the New Testament. Uh, we've finished Metzger, uh, I think, with the midterm. So uh, the only thing we've been doing is reading the, uh, the New Testament for a few weeks. There's only one more lecture, so uh, the end is near. You know, I have even have a, a, at the top of this document a presentation for week eight, but it's actually week nine. So uh, I also wanted to remind you to uh, fully explore this course uh, in the YouTube videos section. There are videos that I've added about um, Ephesus and Corinth. Philippi, and also the mystery religions, and also uh, there's very, I mean, I hate to say this as a, as a teacher, but there's really easy uh, extra credit opportunities for you guys, and the principal one right now is the create your own final, where you uh, just let me know a good questions or questions that you're interested in for the final exam. They can be in any form. You know, you can have multiple guests, fill in the blank, um, essay questions, and any other, you know, any other type of question that you could think of. And whenever I'm working on the final exam, which I'm going to be doing very soon, um, I'm going to consider those questions for inclusion. But you get five points added to your final grade. And I cannot, I have not uh, mathematically figured out what percentage that is of the course, but that's pretty significant for thinking up a few questions. So uh, it, what, what you do is each week, you know, you look at the reading from each week and uh, think up a few questions for each week and post them in, that, in the format that I gave you in the Create Your Own Midterm section of the course. Also, please take advantage of the student feedback forum as well as the questions forum. I'm available to you 
if you have any questions at all. It's just like uh, if we were in a classroom, you can ask me questions. You just have to write them down. So uh, I'd love to hear from you, and I hope all of you are well.